This man is an airline pilot. He lives about 10 miles from Idlewild and he drives to his work. Now you might think this is pretty dangerous work and some recent newspaper headlines might lead you to guess that this man is insurable at a rather high premium. But according to the insurance companies, the most dangerous part of his journey is already over. It says here, breakfast in Karachi, lunch in London, supper in San Francisco, and sometimes we have to add luggage in Rome. Today we're going to look into the crowded sky and consider air safety. Now it's an odd thing about the human mind that it seems to be so constituted that when you say the phrase air safety, most people think of its opposite, air disaster. Every time a plane crashes in Tibet or Kansas, we are grateful that we were not aboard. And yet when 450 people are killed on a holiday weekend on the highways, we don't say it might have been me. Every day, 500,000 people get off the ground, take to planes and fly in all sorts of weather and all sorts of landscapes and come safely to their destinations. How safe is air travel? Well, the insurance companies who employ experts to figure risks, they put it in a rather vivid way. It does not cost an airline pilot one penny more to buy a life insurance policy than it costs a librarian or a grocer. Now, the point of all this is simply that statistically, aviation is one of the safest forms of transport but it's not safe enough. And in some countries, it's a very big issue. And as you will soon see, it is of special concern to the United Nations. Civil aviation started after the First World War. The first airliners were converted bombers of the 1918 vintage. And the first airline passengers were people moved by urgency or bravado. The machines of that period were creaky and underpowered and the pilots were, by today's standards, deaf and blind. Flying was a daytime, fair weather sport, sometimes a desperate expedient. Things are now quite different. For years, airliners have been flying at night in weather both fair and foul, and pilots have been able to supplement their physical senses with all sorts of new devices. Flying is busier, more complex, faster, more important and necessary than ever before. Let's have some. The flight which follows is typical of today's international airline procedure. Because Idlewild has the greatest traffic density of any airport in the world, we shall focus the traffic problem by showing both a takeoff and a landing at the same airport, Idlewild. Now we're going to break the law of gravity. The shape of this plane and the power of its engines is going to help us to overcome gravity by lift and to defeat drag by thrust. And up front there are some very skilled men who are going to see that this goes according to plan. Checklist. Roger. Ready for checklist? Ready for checklist. Wheels. Block safety. Landing gear lever down. Down. Cockpit cabin oxygen pressure. Check. Equipment cooling control. Automatic. Oxygen panels and mass. Check. Circuit breakers. All checked and in. Warning system lights. Check. 
Flow meter power. Normal. Battery and DC power. Check battery on. Electrical panel. Check then set. Fuel quantity and distribution. Distribution normal quantity 37,000. Fuel panel. Check then set. Fuel flow meters. Reset. Hydraulic fluid. Full. Engine start pressure. 3,000 in each bottle. Air conditioning and pressurization. Panel set. Fuel done. Complicated? Engine oil quantity. Technical, of course. But every complicated piece of equipment or procedure consists of a great number of essentially simple things. Things that any of us can understand. Off. Anti-skid. Off. Spoiler switches. On. Passenger oxygen valve. Uh -huh. No smoking seat belt sign. On. Emergency exit light. On. Q inlet heat. Off. Rudder and aileron trim. Neutral. Neutral. Roger, stop checklist complete. At the airport terminal, other men are busy making sure that our flight goes well. The flight plan has been filed and approved, which means that a highway has been set aside for us in the sky. Right, ask for taxi clearance, please. Roger. Idlewild Ground, this is Air India Jet 108. Request taxi clearance, please. Air India 108, Idlewild Ground, by the outer perimeter, right turn taxiway hotel, taxi two, hold short, three one left, wind northwest one zero, the altimeter 2973, time 1641. Over. Air India Jet 108, Roger. Taxiing now. Taxiing. Rogers are ready. Clear my side. Roger. I see up two, but hold short of runway 13 left traffic right now. Okay, but 490, so it's on Air India 108, Clarence. ATC clears Air India 108. By the Idlewild Southwest Radio Beacon. That's the Idlewild 120 radial to Hampton, 252 radial to Hampton. Pick the 46 South Nantucket flight plan route. Now the men in the control tower and the men up front are combining their concentration and considerable technical skill to the problem of getting us off the ground. Now there are several other things that we need to ensure a safe flight. We have to have first, obviously, a well-built, well-designed plane. We have to have airports with long, strong enough runways accurately sighted. We have to have an air traffic system that can separate planes both laterally and vertically. We have to know a good deal about the weather all along the route. Preferably, we should be in continuous contact with the ground, which for which we have to have all kinds of navigational equipment, beacons, charts, and so on. We have to have enough of all these things. Now, whenever you read in a newspaper that there's been an air disaster, one of these things, much more likely a combination, a rather freakish combination of these things, has gone wrong. They don't often go wrong. Last year, the airways of the world managed 108 million separate safe flights, like the one we're on. That was checked. Three my side. Three my side. The power check, takeoff checklist complete. Okay. Idlewild Tower, Air India Jet 108. Permission to take off, please, over. Air India 108, Idlewild Tower, clear for take off, 3 1 left. Okay, rolling. Rogers are ready. Check minimum power, please. Roger, will do. Air India 108, rolling. Gear up. Gear going up. Air India 108, contact the parts control now, 121.1. One, one. Okay, tracking on 120 radio. Roger.
Thank you. Now, at this point, you may well wonder what the United Nations is doing getting into civil aviation. Well, let's put it this way. At this moment, all around the world, thousands of people are taking off from the ground, the ground on which for millions of years they've learned to live on. Now, in Europe and the Middle East and Asia and Africa, the air traffic density is getting worse every month. And on those continents, remember, they have many frontiers, which in the United States we do not have, so that when you fly across Europe, you cross a frontier, seconds divide one language from another, one system of law from another, one culture from that of its neighbor. Now, who's going to call the turn? What language should the pilot speak? What landing instructions should be obeyed by a pilot of one country who's making an emergency landing in another? To bring some sense and order into this traffic jam of the world's airways, the nations decided that they had better get together and establish a world order. And that's why the United Nations is getting into it. And that's why just now we are going over to Montreal. Montreal, Canada is the headquarters of the International Civil Aviation Organization of the United Nations, a member of the UN family, a specialized agency as it's called. The Secretary General of ICAO is a Canadian, Mr. Ronald McDonnell. Pilots and controllers, navigators and radar operators must today be able to speak the same language in more senses than one. They must be able to understand each other, whatever the nationality or the mother tongue. What's more, they must agree on how things are to be done. The business of reaching that agreement is our problem here at the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO for short. You've heard about some of the services required to get a plane up in the air, to keep it up there safely, and to bring it down safely at its destination. When it comes to international flying, every one of these services is our concern. How an airliner is designed and built, how strong a runway must be, the kinds of people who operate aircraft, their training and their licensing, air traffic coordination, the navigator's tools and maps, and so on. You may well ask, what do we at ICAO do about all these things? We operate no radars, we fly no planes, we man no airports. But in our meeting rooms and around our tables, there assemble the civil aviation administrators and experts from most of the world. Together, they work out and agree on the minimum international standards, the essential hard core of safety, which then forms the practical basis for international flying by all nations. Flight safety is an international problem. Never have the airlines been so crowded with such large, fast, internationally moving objects. And the pace is steadily increasing. This problem could only be approached in an international way. And it has been. So you see, the main problem of air safety is separating air traffic. Just keeping planes apart. Because remember, a plane is not assigned a position behind another plane on a highway like an automobile. It must have a clear highway all the way to its destination. And with three or four planes going from point A to point B, this is easy. Common sense takes over. You fly left of this line, I fly to the right. You stay above 10,000 feet, I'll stay below. That's what happens in the country at large. Desert airstrips and rural places, so on. But the aching problem of civil aviation today is the metropolis, with its hundreds of planes landing and leaving. When you approach a metropolis, the air is, the sky is no longer as wide as the horizon. It begins to contract into a rather cramped mesh of highways, crossing, intersecting, running in parallel, running opposite to each other. Then what happens? Well, sometimes this. Hey, look, I'm considering the Navy out of the way. Uh, Put the headset on. Your guy's got to cross Greentown at their altitudes because I'm using half oh, the altitude in here. here at Trans World 353. you got to be, uh, you got to cross Greentown at their altitude. He's going to 17, all right? Him here? Why 17? Him, right? Because the guy off Newark... Vic What's he going? I'm going to 15 only. What altitude do you want? Give me an altitude. We've got no scripts. Give it up to 17. Up to 17, okay. This is New York Control Center at one of the busiest hours of the day, late afternoon. 
Essentially, what these men are doing is the simple but always tricky job of keeping aircraft out of each other's way. Okay, where? Where's American 5? American 5 is out of the way. Okay. And Northwest? Who? Oh, this guy is. Oh, and here's Northwest back here, here's 427 back here. 6,000? I don't know, Manny. I doubt it. I don't think he's out of the way. Oh, where do we? He's out in group. 25 to him. 15? Right. Double 237, right? Target 15, 5, 2, and maintain flight level 0. And 863 to 26. All right, you'll outclimb him. American 348, New York Center and Radar, contact. Doing maintain flight level 2, Turn. Maintain your present heading until uh, 30 seconds, then turn left to 305. 305. American 365, Roger, Bravo, turn right, heading 0, 30, 0, 30, 0, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, tune in the 50 BOR, advise me when you read it, all right? Four, four, Bravo, Roger. Now this American is going to be shooting up your way. Okay, right? I'll bring him across here. All right. United 603, turn left immediately, heading 240 for three minutes. You're overtaking an American convoy, maintaining 1-2,000. In radar, contact, turn around. Over. And an 8-6. Hey, Joe. Yeah, Roger. Saturation to the west, no more altitudes available. Saturation flight? That's correct. Right. Radar is the clue to sorting out these situations and giving the controllers the information on which they can base their decisions. But the radar equipment in use in civil aviation today is blind in one important respect. It does not measure height. An air controller generally has a good picture of the relationship between the ground plan of his airport and the moving blips which represent planes flying in the air. But he does not know, without getting further information, at what altitudes these planes are flying. It looks all the same to him whether one is at 500 feet, another at 50,000, or, and this is the hazard, whether both are at 5,000. Research is at present underway on radar equipment that will measure altitude. Proposals have been presented to ICAO, and the first experimental tower has already been built. But the use of these devices on airlines is still several years away. Now we have a man standing by who knows all about this kind of research and he'll be our guide to the kind of work that's being done to make tomorrow's airliners safe when they're flying at tomorrow's speeds. His name is Jerome Lederer. We know what kind of air traffic system is needed. One day, maybe not too far off, we shall have it. I am with the Flight Safety Foundation, an organization dedicated to making the airways safer. I've also been a consultant for ICAO in Montreal. How will it be different from the present system? Well, for one thing, the whole idea of using a human voice for instructions from ground to air will change. That will be all automated. Each airplane will be allo allocated a movable cube of airspace. Computers will probe for possible conflicts and pass solutions on to the controllers. Only near airports will this area system of automatic control have to give way to a channel type of approach to the runways. Work towards this kind of automated air traffic control system is underway right now. Various aspects of it are being researched here in the United States. Other activities on related fields are being pursued in England, in the Netherlands, and in many other countries. At some point, the stage will have been reached when this system is considered ready for regular international airline use. And at that point, IKEA will enter the picture and the system and perhaps competing ones will develop in other countries will be brought to the conference table at Montreal. There will be intensive consideration of all aspects, cost, practicability, and scope. Finally, an agreement will be reached, an agreement to which all ICAO members will be asked to subscribe. Then the world's airlines will have taken another great step towards uniformity, reliability, and safety in the world's airline. Well, that, of course, is all in the future, and we are concerned with today, or rather with tonight, because we have a get back to the ground and it seems that there's quite a bit of weather about and the pilot has asked for a GCA a ground controlled approach to Idlewild Idlewild ground control this is Air India Jet 108 request GCA approach Air India 108 this is Idlewild radar hear you loud and clear how do you hear me Idlewild from Air India 108, hear you loud and clear. Air 
Air India 108 in radar contact, 11 miles southwest of the airport, heading 010. Air India 108, if no transmissions received for a period of five seconds, on final, proceed to and hold Lido 1,500. Before we complete the final landing, let's pause and look at the role that ICAO plays in it. I am John Bellringer of the ICAO Technical Secretariat. The most critical phase of flight is the final approach to land, and in this connection, the instrument landing system was adopted by ICAO as an international standard some 12 years ago. And today, it serves the airlines on more than 400 runways of the world's airports. Additionally, at a number of the larger international airports, a precise radar system called Ground Controlled Approach, or GCA, is used to guide a pilot by the spoken word to a point from which he can land visually. ICAO has developed technical specifications for GCA which ensure that all installations will perform alike wherever they are located. Without the assistance of ILS and GCA, many flights would need to be diverted to other aerodromes where the weather conditions are more favorable. But this would be both expensive to the airline and inconvenient to the air passenger. Now, let's watch and see how the jet aircraft you've been following is torqued down to a safe landing. Air India 108, turn right, heading 040. Descend to 1,500. Roger, Air India Jet 108. Okay, 1,500 feet, maintaining. Air India 108 is 1,500 feet maintaining. Air India 108, now on final. Do not acknowledge further transmissions. Air India 108, nine miles from touchdown, 300 feet right of course. Turn right, heading 045. Air India 108. Turn right heading 047. On course, eight miles from touchdown. Air India 108, seven miles from touchdown. On course, heading 047. Air India 108, six and one half miles from touchdown. On course, approaching glide path. Air India 108, six miles from touchdown. On course. Air India 108, five miles from touchdown, on glide path, on course, begin descent. Air India 108, 75 feet above glide path, adjust rate of descent. Air India 108, three and one half miles from touchdown, on course, on glide path. Three miles from touchdown, on course, on glide path. Air Indy 108, clear to land, runway four right. Air India 108, passing the outer marker, clear to land, runway four right. Wind, north, northeast, five knots. Air India 108, two miles from touchdown, on course, on glide path. One and one half miles from touchdown, Hello. on course, okay. on glide path. One mile from touchdown, on course, on glide path. Over the approach lights, on course, on glide path. Over the end of the runway, on course, on glide path. Take over visually, complete your approach. Roger, full flaps, full flaps. I do our radar out.
Just another landing, just another flight strip to be cleared from the control board, just another routine bread and butter miracle completed. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an international zone study of the United Nations role in air traffic safety, together with a modest hint that airborne people of all countries would not be as safe as they are if the United Nations had not its own international civil aviation organization. Goodbye.